One more thing, this is uh, part four of the deity of Christ, looking at it from various perspectives. We're in uh, Deuteronomy chapter uh, 32, but I wanted to explain something uh, uh, this morning that I said with regard to Diane and uh, that verse of scripture, Colossians 3.18. You know, I, I, I got to thinking, well, you know, uh, there's nothing to really be concerned about. And I, I wasn't really worried until she started, uh, she changed it to her life's verse. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, Christmas cards, Colossians 3.18, Colossians. <laughs> so I thought, well, maybe I better say something. But no, it's, there's nothing uh, to worry about there or anything. Okay, uh, now that we have that straightened out, we're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, and we will just briefly go through our uh, overhead uh, uh, slides until we get to the last one, and then we will move into the four beginnings. Now, the deity of Jesus Christ to us is an essential. If you do not believe in the deity of Christ, then you cannot be saved. Just simply believing in him as a man does not cut it. Uh, he was more than a man in that he was also God. Now, the two natures did not intermingle or intermix. Uh, he, he was not less than God or more than man, but he was both God and man at one and the same time. And of course, those are doctrines that we have discussed have been years ago now, but it's called the kenosis of Christ, the hypostatic union, uh, the two natures of Christ and so forth. But it's important for us to realize that Jesus Christ was indeed God. Now, he is called God in the Bible. Um, he is referred to as being God. God the Father called him God. And we went through all of those various verses uh, to uh, substantiate the fact that indeed he was recognized as God even before he became man. He was also called Lord. Now, uh, the word Lord is the word Jehovah. Uh, and that is uh, God's personal name. And so therefore, if this name is ascribed to him, and it was, then therefore he must be God. Also, he is called the great God. And uh, we showed you that there are lesser gods, uh, both uh, figments of the imagination, and also, uh, in a sense, both angels and men are called gods as administrators of God's kingdom. But in no way are either angels or men or fallen angels or demons or idols ever called the great God. Uh, that is a term that's reserved for God alone. And uh, Jesus Christ being called the great God indicates that he indeed was part of the Godhead. The word Emmanuel means God with us. Uh, and this is why it should be so exciting, especially for the Jews when it happened, that God actually came down to, to earth to be among men. Uh, so he is with us. Uh, he identifies with us. He's one of us. And the Apostle Paul then uh, actually calls him God manifested in uh, flesh. And the word manifested there, phaner o'o, means to perceive with the eyes, to be able to actually see him. Uh, and, uh, and know and understand that he that has seen me, says Christ, has seen the Father. All right? Also, we uh, noted that uh, Jesus Christ, and that's something we're going to see in just a little bit on the four beginnings. Jesus Christ has always existed. And as long as there is a being that is alive, time is counted. Now, it's hard for us to, uh, to, to weigh time and eternity. We have no concept of this except to call it an eternal continuum. It's something that goes on and on and on and on. But before anything else existed, God existed, and Christ is said to be before all else. Now, the only other being that uh, uh, could uh, make that statement, that boast, as it were, is God himself. Therefore, Christ must be God. 
We saw that uh, John the Baptist said, he's going to be preferred before me because he was before me. Well, he was born six months before Christ. How can that be? He's referring to his deity there. Jesus said before Abraham was, I am. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, the uh, name of God. That's a, a Jehovah title. Uh, is what they're called in theology. Also, Jesus Christ existed before man who was the member of the Godhead who actually got down on his hands and knees in the miry clay, in the mud, and sculpted man. It was Jesus Christ. He's the creator of all things originally. So he had to exist before man. Also, it's Jesus Christ who tells Lucifer, you were perfect in the day that you were created. Jesus Christ uh, predates uh, the angels. And then finally, we're going to uh, see that uh, he it was even before all creation. Now, one uh, last thing here, and we're going to, to um, consider the uh, few verses we still have that are outstanding. And that is, in connection with Antichrist, the Apostle John uses a sort of a, it's a really a neat term. Uh, and it is especially good, not just for us, but for the believers in the tribulation period. Reason? Antichrist pretends to be God. He fools a whole lot of people. And John says, wait one second, I want you to know the true God. Now the true God, therefore, he, as he points out in that verse in 1 John, uh, is a reference back to Jesus Christ. So that makes Christ God. He is equated with God. We saw that in the Old Testament, God is to be the Redeemer. In the New Testament, it's pointed out that Jesus is the Redeemer. We've seen in the Old Testament that God was to be pierced. How can that be? He is a spirit. Well, God assumes flesh, and we find out that to fulfill that verse, Jesus Christ was pierced. So when his flesh was pierced in, in that sense, God uh, uh, was um, on the cross in the person of his son. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto um, himself. Then lastly, it says that God is going to shed blood for the redemption of mankind. And the only one that uh, uh, really shed any blood was the Lord. Okay, just a couple of other things here. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, starting with verse 3, this is point number 19 if you all uh, do have your outlines. There are a couple other things that we did not illustrate that point to the fact that Jesus Christ is God. In the journeys of Israel, there was something that followed them. It wasn't just the Shekinah glory cloud. We're told in the, in the Bible it was a rock. This rock was real important uh, because it was from the rock that uh, Israel uh, was watered. And uh, we're talking about a major water bill. I forget who it was that asked me. As one of you asked me about, did you consider that uh, the nation of Israel in the wilderness would have had a monumental water bill? And that is absolutely true. But the, the fact of the matter uh, was this rock gave them water. Uh, verse 3. I'm going to publish the name of the Lord. Ascribe ye greatness to our God. He, God, is our rock. His work is perfect. All his ways are judgment. He's a God of truth with, uh, without iniquity. Just and right is he. Verse number 18. Of that rock that begat thee, thou art mindful, and hast forgotten God that formed thee. So, uh, without a doubt, when Moses was speaking, as they looked back and viewed this rock, uh, this rock was God. Uh, it was God that they were seeing. It was uh, God that out of himself was making provision for the nation of Israel. But now the Apostle Paul uh, tells us, if we'll turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, that there's something unusual about this rock. And verse number four. They did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. 
And who was the rock? Jesus Christ. Now, this is uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 10, 4. So um, that, that simply means that uh, as we compare these two scriptures, that the rock is called God and the Apostle Paul calls the rock Christ. Therefore, uh, Jesus Christ, it has to be assumed, is God. He is equated with, with God uh, from this particular portion of the, um, the Old Testament. Now, we can do this again from the book of Isaiah, chapter 41. Go back there. I always like uh, you to have a good Bible drill, at least uh, during one service. This is Isaiah chapter 41 and verse number four. Now, the title first and the last, as we will see in just a little bit, is indicative of the fact that God uh, is before creation and after creation. Uh, that he surrounds it all. Uh, so that if you look back, there's God. If you look ahead, there's God. And everything in between exists because he makes it exist. Uh, creation cannot get ahead of God and it can't go back farther than God. Uh, so this, this term is, is really important because only God can make this boast. You go back before creation and who's there? God. You look ahead before creation reaches there in eternity future. But who's there? God. And that's an eternal continuum. God inhabits the eternal present. He's always there. But here's what Isaiah said in relation to this. Isaiah 41, 4. Who hath wrought and done it? calling the generations from the beginning. I, the Lord, the first, uh, and with the last, I am he. Uh, it says the very same thing, a uh, similar uh, thing in Isaiah 44, 6, where God himself is called the first and the last because he's both before and after creation. God living in this eternal continuum surrounds time. He surrounds a creation and history. But the surprising thing about it as we turn to Revelation chapter 2, if we're wanting to point out uh, the fact that we believe that Jesus Christ is God. In Revelation chapter 2, verse number 8, someone else is called the first and the last. Who is that? None other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, therefore, by comparing these scriptures and looking at them, God is the first and the last, and Christ is the first and the last. And the thing that we must assume conclusively, beyond doubt, is that Jesus Christ is one and the same person that is said to be first and the last. Therefore, Christ is God. Verse 8, to the uh, angel of the church at Smyrna, write, These things, and of course Christ is speaking, saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. Turn to chapter 22 of the same book. Revelation 22. And verse number 13, where he says, Jesus is speaking, I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. So all of these things are, are not said just for Christ to be saying something, to give us something to read and to do in our earthly lives. Uh, they're said to give documentation and proof of something that's absolutely important. This person we call Christ, this man who was born, this one who died on the cross, was uh, equated with God and must assumed to be God uh, in every way. In fact, the Apostle Paul says in Philippians that he was in the form of God and he was equal with God. Now, one more thing we want to note. Uh, come back to the book of 
Exodus chapter 34. Before we move into the beginnings, Exodus chapter 34. Now, in this particular portion of Scripture, we are told that God alone is to be worshipped. Exodus chapter 34. And uh, verse number 14. Thou shalt worship no other God. Uh, no man, in other words, no idol, no angel, no one else is worthy of, of worship. It's something that is exclusive to the Godhead. For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. If you give your attention and affection to someone or something other than him, uh, it uh, gets him a little riled, and uh, you end up paying the price. So worship is uh, reserved exclusively for him. But now, the Lord Jesus Christ, in Matthew chapter 2, received worship. I've listed several places where, where this uh, was done. Matthew uh, chapter 2 and verse number 2. Jesus Christ received worship as God even though he was in the form of a man. The only way that someone else could legitimately do this and the only way that Christ could accept it was if he was God. If he accepted the worship and he was not God, he committed a sin, he blasphemed, and was leading people astray. And uh, other people, if they worshiped him, would have committed a sin, if he were not indeed God. Verse number two, the wise men. Where is he that is born king of the Jews? We've seen his star in the east, and here's why we've come. We're come to worship him. They knew from Daniel and the prophecies in the Old Testament that the one to be born was going to be a God-man. And therefore, they had uh, no reservations. Why are you here? I'm here to worship the Christ child. He's, he's God in the flesh. And um, in verse number 11, very same thing. When they were come to the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. So... Um, we know that he was God because when he was an adult, there were others who fell down and worshipped him, and he never, he never rejected it. He never said, like Peter, Cornelius uh, uh, had Peter to come into his house, and Cornelius fell down, and the Bible says worshipped him. And the Apostle Peter said, whoa, wait one second, I also was a man. <laughs> uh, your worship is misplaced. I can't do anything. I'm just like you, a sinner, uh, soon to be saved by grace here. Uh, but Jesus Christ accepted the worship. That means that he must must be God or he would have sinned and those who worshiped him would have uh, sinned were he not God okay so we're going to move then to the four beginnings and uh, let's turn first of all to Psalms 90 now this is sort of an addendum uh, to this but to this study that Jesus Christ is God but it is helpful. Psalms 90. And uh, let's uh, bring eternity down into the picture here. Really slow moving. There, finally, eternity falls into place. When we draw eternity, contrasting it in this fashion, Usually you'll note, we draw a future and we draw a past. And uh, there's a reason for that, as we said just a little bit ago, because God surrounds it. Uh, and creation did, did not have a past except on the drawing board of God, His plans. And it will not have a future except as He goes before and prepares the way for, um, for us to exist at, at that point. Now, verse number two tells us about this concept. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from, and you'll note, 
from everlasting to everlasting. Those are two points that let us know in the past and in the future, there's God. He surrounds it all. And it's one of those concepts, you know, where Paul says, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, dispensational truth, from, from one point uh, uh, here to the next point in history to the next point in history. And that's what this does. From everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. You're in the past, you're in the future, and everything in between is sort of sandwiched in between your uh, uh, presence. Okay. So that brings us then to two important verses of Scripture. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and John chapter 1, verse 1. Let's bring God in the picture. He says he's the ancient of days, he's the old one. So he comes moseying in, probably on his cane and so forth. Uh, and there he is. We've got creation in between him. Now, this is the way that it, it looked for the longest time with regard to history. It's just God. No one else um, uh, existed. But uh, God is said to have a beginning of sorts. Now, we know that he has no real beginning nor ending, and I'm going to explain what I mean. But there was, in essence, a start to all of this with God's relationship to creation. So, two technical words we're going to see here. Verse number one. In the beginning, God created the heaven, that's the plural, actually, the heavens and the earth. Now, Bereshith is a Hebrew word that is the technical word here. And it means in a beginning, which was not a beginning. In a start, which was not a start. Uh, now, uh, you, you have, a, uh, you have a, a ball game and, uh, you know, let's play ball. That's where it starts. But was that actually a start? Well, no, because people existed. They, everybody was in the, the bleachers. Uh, the ball players arrived. Uh, uh, the uh, the uh, <laughs> the uh, Star Spangled Banner was sung or or played, uh, and everybody's there for the ball game. Uh, so they're already there. They're already in existence. But then they say, "Let's play ball. Let's start the game." That's a beginning which was not a beginning. Uh, it started the game, but there were already people there in existence before the game began. And that's what this word means, technically. It's a beginning which was not a beginning. It started God's creative process, but for God, it, it, uh, he was already there, you see. Now, the same concept is given us in John chapter 1. Now, don't let that uh, become a, um, confusing to you. Uh, hopefully, that illustration helped, but that's what it means. There was somebody already there before it started, but it started at that point, it had a beginning. So John chapter one tells us that the Elohim, the Godhead, that created the heavens and the earth in the beginning, which was not a beginning of Genesis 1-1, is now broken down in the beginning, Arche the Greek equivalent. You know what arche means? In the beginning, which was not a beginning. Uh, God was already there, he already existed, and it started at that point and went on. Uh, so, in effect, God said, let's play ball. Uh, God said, let's get on with it. God said, uh, let there be, and it was. But he already existed in the beginning, or literally before the start of things. And it breaks down the members of the Godhead. In the beginning, which was not a beginning for God, was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. So it takes us right prior to the point of creation and the start of things. All right, now come back to the book of Psalms 148.
Now, you will note that it is our stand here. We do not believe in a young earth. And that's another battle that's going to be fought amongst the brethren. And there are going to be a lot of people disfellowshipped because they don't believe in a, in a young earth. Now, all that means is that we believe that man is a relatively new creation on earth, 6,000 years, but that the earth is very, very old. Uh, and it uh, was... Um, was there from the beginning. And we believe that God basically created things and they, as soon as he spoke, they came into existence. However, we also must qualify that. There are orders in the beginning of things. We just saw the one in the beginning, God. Okay, so God had a beginning, but again, which for him was not a beginning, but it was the start of the creative process. But there was a second uh, uh, group, or shall we say a first created group, those were the angels. God had a, a purpose for the angels. Uh, and in everything, he want, uh, wants people to be his witnesses. He wants them to see himself manifested, his power, uh, his awesomeness, and so forth. So the angels were created next. Uh, Psalms 148, praise the Lord, verse 1, praise you the Lord from the heaven, praise him in the, in the heights, praise him all his angels, praise him all his hosts, and then it goes down, praise him sun, moon, praise him star. Now you'll note that the angels are referred to first, before the sun and the moon and the stars of light and the heavens of heavens and so forth. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded, and they were created. He established them forever, and made a decree that they uh, shall not pass. The angels were made first. And they were witnesses to his phenomenal creative power. Let's go to the book of Hebrews, chapter 1. Book of Hebrews, chapter 1. And the uh, verse 4, and then the last part of verse 6, and then uh, the um, we'll go down to um, verse number 10. Jesus Christ was made better than the angels in relation to creation because by inheritance he's a more, has a more excellent name. He's God. He's God the Son. And so therefore, the last part of verse 6, let all the angels of God worship him. Now here all the angels are created and uh, God the Father says, now here's my command, I want you to worship him. Why? I mean, What's he ever done for me? Well, he just created you. Yeah, but uh, there's the emptiness of space here. Uh, why should I respect him? Uh, why should I appreciate him? Uh, what has he done? Okay, so God the Father is going to manifest the genius and the power of his son to these angels. He's going to get their attention and he's going to get their respect real fast. How's he going to do that? He's going to uh, create the universe and that's the next thing that comes into being verse number 10 and thou lord in the beginning has laid the foundation of the earth the heavens are the works of your hands they'll perish but you're going to remain the same and so forth um, but the point that we're, we're uh, uh, talking about here is that the father said the son made the universe and he did it following the angels there to be his, his witnesses of this awesome power. You realize to be able to stand on nothing and to say, let there be, and the billions upon billions of light years of, uh, of the universe to be created with all of the planets, all of the stars, all of the life, and, and so forth, except for man. Now, uh, that was something that was praiseworthy and uh, worth singing about. Did it happen? Yes. Job chapter 38. Job chapter 38. 
Now, Job is easy. It's right before Psalms. So here is God. God the Father gives a signal to God the Son, and he says, let there be, and the angels came into existence before the sun, moon, stars, the heavens of uh, the heavens. They were there first. God the Father said to him, uh, I want you to worship this guy at my right hand. He is my son, and he is worthy. And now for a demonstration. Perhaps the greatest of all demonstrations of his uh, deity with regard to, um, uh, to, to his power. It says in verse number four, talking to Job. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if you have understanding. See, man wasn't there. Uh, no man was created. Adam was not there when Jesus Christ created the angels and the universe. Who laid the measures thereof, if you know? Or who has stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? You know, that's, that's an interesting question. How does the earth hang there? Well, we know now it's gravity and centrifugal force and the, and the like. Uh, but uh, uh, who laid the cornerstone thereof? Now note these two verses. When the morning stars sang together, there was a point in time when the angel saw the awesome creative power of Jesus Christ in bringing the entire universe there. What's so, what's so important about it? That's their home. Remember, he is before all things and by him all things uh, consist. And when he did this, he brought the visible and, uh, or the invisible, the angels, and the visible together. They saw their new home. They saw where their dominions were going to be. They saw where they were going to live. They saw their, their thrones and their cities and everything uh, that Jesus Christ had in its pristine originality. Let there be and bang, there was uh, the universe uh, scattered for, uh, you know, on and on seemingly forever. And so what did that cause them to do? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. I don't know how many angels there uh, were, but uh, you know we have people that shout to the top of their lungs at a, a sports event to, so much that they get hoarse because all of them with one voice are rooting their team on to victory. And all of a sudden this happened and the entire angelic host to the top of their lungs shouted, you know, hallelujah, amen, man, uh, what a guy is this Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, when all the morning stars uh, sang together, and all the sons of God uh, shouted for joy. I just meant to verse number seven. There is the one that we wanted to say. So, there is a beginning, which was not a beginning. Then, at that beginning, you have the angels. Then there is a second beginning, and that, of course, is uh, the universe. Now, just a, a couple of other things here uh, with regard to this and the angels. Uh, Psalms 19 and then Psalms 8. God had a creative beginning, though not a personal beginning. The angels had a beginning uh, uh, at that point of creative uh, beginning. Then we see that the, there was a beginning for the universe when all of the angels witnessed uh, it uh, coming into existence. But we contend that that was God's purpose for creating them first. Uh, who else better could, could witness the, the fact of the whole universe coming together than beings who can fly through space and who can amass themselves together to see all that happened? I mean, uh, man just simply could not do that in essence. They were there at the point of him speaking forth the universe. Now, what did this do for them? These verses pertain to them as well. Verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament shows his handiwork. The glory meaning his power, his genius. The firmament shows his handiwork. 
uh, that all of these things came together at once perfectly. Day unto day utter speech, night unto night chose knowledge. There's no speech nor language which their voice is not heard. Now Psalms chapter 8. And it says in verse 3, this is something the angels did before David ever did. When I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and stars which you have ordained, what is man that you're mindful of him, the son of man that you've visited him? You made him lower than the angels and crowned him with glory and honor and made him to have dominion over the works of your hands and put all things under his feet. That's part of Operation Footstool. That's part of the angelic uh, uh, challenge and conflict where now men are going to be put in charge where the angels once had their thrones. But the, the fact is, Angels saw these things first, and they forfeited it all. One last uh, verse here in Matthew chapter 19, where we have the fourth beginning. Matthew chapter 19. And... The fourth beginning is where we bring man into the picture. Man now from this little, a puny little satellite called Earth going around the sun, looks up at the stars. The angels, of course, were there before the whole thing and, and saw it all come into existence. We come after the fact and we look up there and then, then uh, uh, we wonder about it all. Uh, they were involved as witnesses when it was realized. But aside from that, what we've been noticing is there are beginnings to these things. God had a creative beginning. At the creative beginning, the angels were there. The angels witnessed then the beginning of the universe, its creation, uh, when he spoke and decreed and it came to pass. And then lastly, Jesus Christ says that when man was created, it started something new. Man had a beginning. And that takes us to the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve. Matthew 19, verse number 4. Jesus answered and said to them, Have ye not read that he... That's a, that's a neat thing. He's referring to himself because he's the one who uh, created man. But uh, the, the scriptures do not uh, uh, indicate that uh, uh, here. He's just pointing back to the fact. He which made them note these words at the beginning. This is the point of recreation. Man too had a beginning and a start uh, in order to resolve the angelic conflict. There needed to be an inferior race in order for Jesus Christ to be made lower than the angels uh, because we are now going to fight over who has the right to rule this universe that the angels saw Christ create. And uh, Lucifer is trying to take it over and that's why man was created to resolve this whole thing. But just like Lucifer, just like the angels and the universe, man too has a beginning. And at that point, he made them male and female. So uh, all of these things as well point to the fact that Jesus Christ uh, was God. But then it helps us to understand that he is the first and the last. And he uh, uh, makes everything consist in between.